Good evening, good evening. Uh, this is the second session of chats about Adam Curtis's Can't Get You Out of My Head. <clears throat> and this is part of my Monday evening philosophy research discussions where I try and do philosophy in public. Um, I teach on Monday evenings for the Free University of Brighton, but when I'm not teaching, I try and um, uh, I try and speak about what I've been doing that week as a philosopher. Now, I'm not obviously going to speak about all the stuff I've been doing this week. Um, I'm mainly focusing this around the Curtis at the moment. But that's the general idea of these philosophy research discussions. So that it kind of <coughs> forces me to recap and think about what I've been doing that week in such a way as to be able to explain it to somebody else. Um, so that's what we're doing this week. Um, fine, right. So let's a little bit of a, a preliminary. What we're going to look at, what I'm going to try and look at today, I suppose, is I want to explore a slightly more positive take on Curtis than I perhaps had yesterday, um, particularly in terms of him producing material for dreaming and the role of that dreaming but i also want to talk a little bit about um his use of the concept of power and the way in which we might want to think instead about autonomy and the kind of difference that there might be around that um that's kind of partly what i'm thinking about so last week if you um have listened or watched last week's uh, well not last week uh, the last session the first session of this of this sort of chat about Curtis <coughs> what what you'll have come across is me talking about uh, um, the way in which his narrative was kind of uh, giving an account of the failure of politics but locates itself almost entirely within the cultural I and mean, in particular within this sort of individual versus collective kind of dynamic and how that that kind of uh, that that the way in which he's trying to present an account about the failure of politics was was particularly ironic, given that he didn't seem to actually talk about a lot of stuff that we might think of as being spoken about in terms of politics. In particular, for me, the the Marxist model. And I was speaking about uh, the way in which his sense of like a causal narrative from the sixties and seventies and from this kind of pernicious individualism that he thinks is there he sort of as a, what I was saying he was he, he that he that he kind of presents it like a kind of causal narrative an inadvertent effect causal narrative not one in which you know we we got the effect we wanted or deliberately intended but as though somehow this pernicious individualism from the 60s and 70s led to or caused um, the kind of collapse in political power that he tries to sort of diagnose um and one of the things I was saying is is that actually that the moment of that individualism that he identifies was a moment of structural crisis in capitalism, the answer to which was neoliberalism. And what we're actually perhaps seeing now is, is another structural crisis um, in which the answer isn't individualism, <laughs> so uh, uh, nor collectivism, perhaps. And so there's a kind of... That instead of there being a causality, there's perhaps more like a parallelism. You know, there's a kind of analogous situation, a structural crisis in capitalism, and different responses that might be made to that, um, but perhaps not a, a causal sort of dynamic in the sort in the in the way in which Curtis kind of tries to establish this kind of narrative. So what I want to do this week is complicate that a little bit. So not go back on what I was saying. I still think the Marxist model has some strengths there that we need to be, you know. Um, aware of and we need to think seriously about um as i said last week you don't need to be a marxist to think seriously about the marxist model or to take it seriously um, but i wonder so I'm, so I'm not trying to sort of go back on it i still think that's a, a serious problem in some ways with curtis and perhaps the most serious problem is you know in terms of politics in curtis uh, so i don't want to go back on that but what i do want to do is try and complicate the situation a little bit and that's um i think uh, point often at which we begin to try and take seriously what someone is saying the principle of charity this is some, sometimes called inside <coughs> philosophy with the principle of charity basically says something like you know um, don't assume the author or the person who's talking is an idiot you know <laughs> try and assume that they're, they're, they're that they've got something to say and then like work out what it is you might not understand yet in that um that's uh, roughly speaking something like the principle of charity needs to be applied to Curtis and there's a reason for that which is um that is he's he's explicit the manifest narrative of his dialogue if you like um 
he's not particularly rigorous it's not but as i said last week one of the things that's difficult is there's no sort of sources in there but one of the other things is that it it, it feels um like it wanders all over the place and it does um and it feels uh, like it's trying to build a narrative through association which i think it is um and so sometimes you know um, it's easy to think oh really there's nothing there let's not bother about it um but I think that one of the reasons I'm interested in Curtis is that he kind of, uh, I feel like he presents the archetype of the liberal mind at the moment. Uh, that sounds like an odd thing to say, particularly if you're American. It means something different, no doubt, than it does in the UK or in the rest of the world. Um, in, in the US, I you can get the sense that liberal is, is has, has very different connotations. But what I mean by that is he, 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 he sort of, I, I think Curtis... <coughs> um, in the UK, you'd understand this expression. Curtis is like the archetypal guardian reader. Um, in other words, sort of uh, lower, to, you know, lower middle class or middle class kind of educated, usually kind of um, left-ish leaning liberal, um, but someone who you know believes in justice and fairness and and the role of democracy and all these kind of positive attributes that, that are attached to our system. Um, and um, at the same time whilst believing in those things sort of constantly feels like somehow there's something amiss or there's something not quite right or there's something not working properly so the kind of classical liberal um, social improver shall we say that kind of thing and so I think I think of Curtis as a kind of archetype of that and so I think that's one of the reasons I'm interested in his work at the moment is, is that it enables me to try and like have a figure of this uh, liberal um, uh, this liberal political consciousness that I can actually kind of engage with a little bit rather than just a straw sort of, uh, you know, a, a straw figure. So as I say, complicating Curtis a little bit tonight, or complicating the critique of Curtis from the first session a little bit tonight. Um, and I want to start there, I think. Let's, let's start to do that by, by looking at the way in which Curtis finishes um, the first episode. Okay, so this is how he how he finishes the first episode. This is a kind of he's giving his own summary here, in a sense, of what's going on. And he's been speaking during this first episode about Chang Ch Chang Kitching, um, uh, Mao's partner, Mao's wife, about uh, Kerry Thornley, the Discordian, and about Michael De Freitas, the sort of British Black Power Michael X figure. Um, and so he's kind of he's talking about the way in which their kind of individualism or their kind of approach to power um, uh, as a struggle with powers of the past was kind of failing and, and he brings up this other other issue or this other power um, that I think is worth worth paying attention to all three Zhang Qing Michael de Freitas and Kerry Thornley knew that their struggle was with the forces from the old power of the past that they believed were still lodged in people's minds. But at the same time, quietly rising up was a new system that seemed as if it would never have to face that struggle because it would be completely free of the past. The laws of human thought that George Boo had created had become the central structure of all thinking machines, computers. Because it fitted perfectly with the binary switching system inside them, either zero or one. And it was used by the machines to create endless branching pathways of binary logic, called algorithms. Out of that was going to come the dream of artificial intelligence, machines that could think independently that could then order and manage the world as a rational system, not driven by the dangerous ideologies of the past. Terrible. I've just been nattering away without speaking the mic back on, so that got silence for a couple of minutes. So what I was going to say is, is that that bit of Curtis there introduces... Um, a kind of a kind of key element uh, that's outside of this individual collective narrative that he talks about. It introduces this element of the cybernetic, 
And the cybernetic is a theme throughout a lot of Curtis's work. Um, and uh, it's something that he keeps returning to. And by cybernetic, we don't mean simply computers, robots, things like that. What we mean is, or what we refer to, is a, is a discipline of cybernetics, a kind of theoretical discipline. Um, but a theoretical discipline that involves things like game theory, that involves you know, producing models, that word model again, I was talking about the Marxist model last week. So it's a theoretical discipline that produces these kind of models, but it produces uh, theoretical models that are able to be programmed into the computers, that are able to translate from that theoretical space into the practical space, the concrete space, if you like, of information technology and computers. And so cybernetics has a kind of privileged relationship uh, intellectually in terms of the intellectual framing of the way in which computers kind of operate. Uh, and what, was, what's, what Curtis is trying to do here, and I think one of the things that's interesting about what he's trying to do, is he's trying to introduce history and the past back into this um, concept of the cybernetic and back into this concept of information technology. Um, and he's trying to introduce the past into this uh, and he's trying to introduce, as it were, the social back into this because quite often those models are taken to be... Perhaps not seriously, but they're taken to be or they're kind of approached as somehow neutral or somehow absent of the past, somehow a kind of break with the past. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, um, we can encounter this as a kind of trope amongst a lot of uh, discussion of, of, you know, cyber theory, cybernetics. We can we can find it in things like the, the idea about the singularity. We can find it in this idea about a kind of radical break or some split um, into a new form of rationality, all these kind of things. And so I think one of the things that Curtis does that's really interesting, and one of the reasons it's worth complicating any kind of critique of Curtis uh, that, that might be made simply from a kind of Marxist position, which I think is a legitimate critique, but one of the reasons of complicating that is that he does do something interesting at this point by trying to introduce that past back into that concept of the cybernetic. And he goes on from the point in the film to talk about the way in which this past begins to infect the servers um, and, and he, the system of thought he says inside in the machines had its own history um, I, and, and when he says that he says born in a time when science became involved in power and control and empire so he kind of locates the original history of cybernetics in a sense and of, of some of this information technology in colonialism um, but he also approaches it, he, and he uses this phrase, you know, trying to colonize the last free outpost, the human mind. So he also has this clear idea that's not only his, it, it's around in, in philosophy and in social cultural theory. Um, he also has this idea of a kind of new um, mental landscape, a new, uh, sometimes the word is newosphere, a new sphere of ideas, a new sphere of concepts. Um, like a paradigm shift or a radically new game uh, that's going to arrive with computer rationality and cybernetic rationality. A kind of neutral rationality is going to become possible, supposedly. At least this is the account um, against which Curtis seems to be playing his uh, or trying to articulate his narrative. And so when he tries to introduce history into this sort of situation, give, give computers a past, if you like, give programming a past, give, you know, um, give the systems and structures uh, of information technology a past. Um, one of the things I think he's trying to do is actually uh, um, a legitimate attempt to, to carry out something like a material analysis of uh, an intellectual um, and, and knowledge framework that is obviously very important to our contemporary culture. And in doing that material analysis, one of the things he does is, 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 yeah, is refer to this very strange thing called something what, which I would call the garrison function. Or, you know, um, let's just, uh, just remind ourselves of that a little bit. So he's spoken at various points about... Uh, this guy Garrison, who talks about time and propinquity, um, and time and propinquity. Uh, so propinquity is the physical or psychological proximity between th people and things. Um, it can mean something like a kinship between people or a similarity in nature between things. Um, and so propinquity is a kind of pattern structure 
and time here is you know the pr time and propinquity so the kind of coincidence and patterns coincidence and relationships that's kind of what this model looks for uh, this new garrison function model um, and Curtis is trying to kind of he's trying he's critiquing this model uh, he's, he's sort of suggesting that it's not particularly positive but he's also suggesting that it's kind of tied in with the way in which cybernetics frames its problems and so cybernetics kind of frames its problems it seems this is, seems to be the way Curtis is, is sort of thinking about cybernetics cybernetics frames its problem as somehow outside of history and as somehow um, a new form of rationality but it also does this because in a sense the data is too difficult um, things are too complex and so instead of being able to get a, a, a rationality that is um, able to render the world transparent or fully transparent as perhaps we might have thought scientific rationality was trying to do um, what actually is done in cybernetics is that uh, rationality is there not to render the world transparent but to manage the world to be able to deal with it um, and that's actually quite a big shift and the reason it's there to be able to manage the world and deal with it is is and is partly because of this relationship to complexity but partly because it picks up on Curtis suggests this kind of garrison function of looking for particular kinds of patterns um, and in the process and this is kind of one of the interesting things in in the process it kind of replicates some of those patterns uh, in particular it kind of replicates the patterns of conspiracies conspiracies such as the ones by Thornley Kerry Thornley for the conspiracy around the Illuminati so so this is a kind of interesting it, it, it's as it's as though we get a kind of developmental discussion going on here or a, very, a developmental account of the kind of rise of the internet the rise of information technology the rise of the kind of cybernetic framework of uh, modern capitalism um, but if you imagine it as a kind of entity if you imagine it as a child uh, one of the things that seems to be being suggested is it's kind of growing up in a particular environment um, and learning to think uh, in a particular kind of way tracking habits of those around the, you know the, of the way thought is done around it and so you kind of imagine this situation or I kind of imagine this situation where he's, he's kind of describing the social context and the attachment of the past that's that's there inside um, inside the servers as he puts it, <coughs> it, it it's there because of a familial connection and there's something quite really strange about this because obviously he's kind of presenting this garrison function of like you know, propinquity and time like so uh, so association and coincidence um, relation and coincidence he's he's kind of presenting that as, as, as something to be critiqued as something that kind of gives up transparency but he's also in a sense obviously using this um, and that's kind of that it, it, I mean I'm still not quite sure whether I would say he was using this throughout throughout the whole of the the film but there's a really strong sense when he talks about garrison when he talks about this time and propinquity issue of, of you know there's a really strong sense of thinking well isn't that what you're doing <laughs> this is really odd um, but you're doing this you, you know you're doing it with this kind of counter narrative um in which you're kind of saying this is somehow a wrong kind of thing to be doing or has a problem and there's this lovely phrase at one point where he talks about the way that patterns moved into data and multiplied endlessly across the system and the patterns he's kind of talking about at this point are the patterns of conspiracy theories such as the Illuminati theory that Operation Mindfuck carry Thornley um, uh, and the way in which they have the same pattern as it were you know um, whether they're fake or whether they're real and so what begins to happen is that the pattern can't have a distinction inside itself between whether it's true or whether it's false it's just a pattern um, and so when we hear a kind of conspiracy that's uh, um, true like you know, Cointelpro or something or um, the conspiracy around McCarthy or the, the conspiracies around some of the stuff to, you know um, that's in, involved in, in various you know uh, in, in various sort of CIA narratives MK Ultra narratives so th there's a kind of sense in which all we're left with is the fact that there are there are kind of pattern um, 
we're without the, the the truth value established next to it we don't we kind of we kind of remove that that truth value thing we kind of remove whether it's real or whether it's false and we're just left supposedly with this kind of pattern of of a conspiracy um now that's i mean there's a there's a sense in which the, the, in, in which curtis is kind of trying to to give an account of a of a collapse here of um uh, an easy relationship to truth uh, let's say or or a sustainable relationship to reality um that often is diagnosed under notions like postmodern or whatever i mean notions that i don't particularly like but um notions of relativism this is the problem that people kind of have so we end up with this um this world in which we can't really make decisions can't really make distinctions because we can't really trust anything and uh this i mean i think there's a, there's an awful lot of problems with that narrative because i'm you know it has to rely upon some previous halcyon day in which this truth relationship was actually there and uh, that i think is problematic and it has to kind of you know um it, ca it kind of articulates a kind of loss of, of intelligence and a loss of knowledge now because of a, a, you know, a, a way of thinking that somehow could be put aside um, and but that wasn't there in the past and so again there's, a, there's this kind of strange sort of sense of what's going on there but all of it for Curtis is orientated around something to do with power and it, it, very roughly it's something like uh, pre previously so prior to the 50s and 60s, prior to the level of complication that begins inside capitalism and consumer capitalism, previously it was kind of possible to have um, what we might call you know, an enlightenment rationality model of the world in which we took it to be transparent in its operation. Um, and we kind of acted on the world politically on the basis of the fact that we could understand the world. Um, and that this has somehow moved to a position in which we don't understand the world or can't understand the world. And so Curtis's narrative is kind of is locked into this this background sense of loss or this background sense of mourning almost. Um, and it's not entirely clear whether that's I mean that's so common and widespread now. It's not entirely clear whether that's just a reflection of the things around him or whether that's a key part of his narrative. Um, but that loss that's supposedly there and sometimes a loss in terms of our understanding of the world um, means that power is is uh, has to be articulated or understood differently and this seems to me to be one of the interesting points that also develops so first of all he, he does develop this attempt to sort of somehow connect cybernetics to its past to its history to its social context not entirely sure I agree with exactly the way he does it but I, I think that attempt is important and useful and secondly he tries to articulate these shifts and changes in our of knowledge structures as having effects um, in terms of our relationships to power and it's one of the things he, he argues is that you know, Chang Ching and Kerry Thorne and Michael Defritas, you know they they have a, in a sense a failed struggle against old forms of power um, uh, and the you know their their kind of response in a sense is is a kind of individualism um, but it's a kind of failed response it kind of fails in many different ways not only just because of the individual collective narrative that develops afterwards but it kind of fails on its own terms it doesn't quite give them what they want and michael de Freitas is probably the um the most tragic of these figures in some ways that he presents at this point uh, but that kind of movement that kind of answer to the problems of power um, the answer being individualism is as it were uh, a bad response to a, an old into a past you know to a real problem um, but cybernetics is is posed as um, arriving without a past arriving without any of this kind of baggage uh, as a solution as a way of, of like wiping out the past um, it's a kind of interruption in that sense um, and I think that element of what Curtis is saying is, is worth bearing in mind. There's a really strong element of a kind of technophilia sometimes in which 
Um, and I think this, 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 you know, it, it sometimes connected to revolutionary, sometimes connected to reactionary thought, sometimes just connected to a kind of efficiency thought. But there's this kind of, you know, sense in which, you know, um, a, a good system, a good rational system, can do away with all these old-fashioned problems. Um, and it's always difficult to kind of grasp quite how that would work, other than in some awful kind of year zero scenario, um, which we really, you know, I mean, we've seen we've seen it before, and we don't really want to necessarily go down that route. But I think one of the difficulties here is in um, is in this articulation of power that underlies what Curtis is doing. So gaining power seems to be the way in which he poses this. Um, gaining power or losing power. It's a kind of quantitative dynamic. Uh, and it's interesting in the second episode where he begins to present some of this sort of uh, difficulty with strategies for resistance um, because he begins to present the difficulties of the revolutionary response to inequalities of power or to capitalist power and, and he begins to develop the ways in which they fail or they become confused or, or trapped in um, this pernicious individualism that he thinks develops in the 60s and 70s um, but it's important to think of that of the way in which he's framing all of these as somehow like a kind of quantification of power. Try it. So, so resistance involves trying to gain more power. Um, and the tension is that that power for the people, if you like, comes in, for, in the form of collectivity. Um, and that's the main way in which we could sort of gain power to you know, take it away from those in power. Whereas the, the, the power of the capitalist, the power of the ruling class, the power of those in power doesn't necessarily come from collectivity. It comes from, um, you know, from capital and from money and from the deployment of that in particular kinds of ways. The key way being cybernetics and um, mass data analysis and all this kind of stuff. And so it's as though we kind of we kind of presented with a sense in which the only strategy for gaining an increase in power is through the collective um, and there's a sense in which I think that's absolutely right and there's a sense in which I think the way in which Curtis poses this is absolutely wrong and completely muddle-headed um, and so I'm again kind of critiquing Curtis I realize but I'm trying to critique him in a kind of positive sense here because I think there's something interesting about this um, and I think he points to this problem of, of the relationship to power, but I think he does so almost classically as a liberal. And, and, and I think one of the reasons they have this kind of sense of power as a kind of quantitative is because they have these archetypal moments of power transition and power change in liberal democratic elections um, in which a minimum input produces a kind of maximal output. Um, so the minimal input of the vote... Um, uh, produces this maximal output of like the whole social quantification of a particular political um, consciousness or or mentality um, at a particular point in time. So it kind of it you know it has this particular role for, for people involved in liberal democracy because they kind of they they kind of see power as 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 as, as I mean whether whether explicitly or not but they kind of see power as bound up with the number of votes in a ballot box. Now, there's a sense, of course, in which obviously that's true. You know, in our, in our contemporary society, power is um, transferred often, let's say in the UK, um, through the ballot box. But as we saw recently in America, uh, that's not always quite as simple uh, as, as it first appears, because other things then come into play. Um, and I think. <laughs> I think if we wanted to interestingly kind of find somewhere to go um, that isn't following Curtis but that's kind of using Curtis here, I think if we wanted to find somewhere interesting to go that didn't get us kind of caught in this trap, because I think it is a trap, this kind of trap of, of how do we get quantitative power, um, then I think we need to begin to think of, of freedom in a slightly different way. Um, in particular, I think what we need to do is, is begin to think about a different kind of pairing um, or a different kind of set of concepts, not so much power um, and, it, and, its, 
agency and relationship to it, rather autonomy and the autonomic. Um, and the, so autonomy, the independent, um, and the autonomic, the involuntary. And, and of these two elements of... Uh, of I'm going to say human life, but I think it probably extends further. I think these are almost kind of ontological elements. But these two elements of autonomy and autonomism, autonom autonomic, uh, rather, um, the the independent and the involuntary, um, uh, th somehow I think it's, it, it's almost better to try and think in terms of the relationship between those. Um, and that freedom is, in a sense, uh, a kind of positive or useful balance of these or useful interaction between these two elements um, and unfreedom is a kind of negative or, or a self-destructive or, or a limiting interaction between these two elements and the reason I want to talk about those because it's because I think it's almost impossible to really um, extricate the discussion around cybernetics from um, the need to take account of autonomy and the autonomic um, because in the sense that's that's when people talk about and artificial intelligence or when people talk about um, you know the role of AI inside these kind of cybernetic systems uh, what we're not talking about is sort of um, human formed people with a kind of Turing test interface with the world we're not talking about um, really the kind of AI consciousnesses um, that we see in sci-fi films what we're really talking about are um, uh, programmed agents within the sort of cybernetic system that are autonomous and have a kind of autonomic function in other words that they are kind of self-regulating and carry out um, necessary tasks and these are kind of key elements of, of the way in which the computer system operates and the internet and the cybernetic systems operate. Um, they enable degrees of, um, the, of the autonomic that was much more complicated before. Um, and in doing so, they also enable um, degrees of autonomy. And in a sense, uh, there's kind of an autonomous autonomic process that we can think of as the process of freedom. Um, and you know, freedom in this contemporary moment of cybernetics and climate chaos is a kind of crisis of those autonomous, autonomic tensions. Uh, so I want to kind of expand on that a little bit because I think, I mean, I think in a sense, um, in, in a sense, Curtis is right to kind of point to the way cybernetics begins to look at, at patterns and all these kind of things, but he's wrong in, in that he's not really focused on the way in which uh, at the heart of cybernetics is this is this sort of sense of allowing the machine, enabling the machine to be able to do it better, um, not better than human, but be able to do it better, uh, and to sort of in a in a sense, the production of a kind of freedom inside the machine as well um, that can. Uh, in its that, that can you know that has potentials there for the rest of our social social system. So what do I mean by this? This auto so autonomous autonomous. I think you know we can we can talk about it, it, the autonomous relatively easily. We're kind of familiar with the notion of autonomous. As I say, it's kind of means independent. Um, it often, however, refers to like whole organisms or machines, uh, whole systems. You know, we can we could call uh, a system autonomous when it's independent of external control. And of course, we kind of would take ourselves, you know, it's the kind of core of our freedom, we take ourselves to somehow be autonomous, uh, often perhaps through the use of our reason, but just um, just fundamentally, in a sense, you know, freedom is kind of connected to uh, our autonomy. Now, on the other hand, um, the autonomic is often described in terms of the involuntary, but it's often described as well in terms of bodily biological processes. And so we find talk about the autonomic system uh, and the various autonomic systems, one of which, for example, is breathing. Um, but one of the things that's interesting between autonomic systems and autonomy is that they aren't static. They're not in a fixed relationship. Um, so through autonomy you can begin to affect some autonomous systems and you can also begin to produce autonomic systems. Um, what do I mean by that? So the production of a habit, 
um, is in a sense the production of an autonomic system, something that's going to work in a kind of involuntary, automatic way. It's going to work, as it were, without us having to pay attention to it. Um, and producing good habits um, is a fundamental part of uh, expanding our poten expanding our potential, expanding our power. You know. Um, Though that kind of habit of practice, for example, if you're learning a musical instrument or you're doing philosophy, the habit of practice, or you're studying sorcery or engaging in um, pretty much anything, in fact, that you want to sort of learn, um, that kind of practice of getting into a, a kind of rhythm or a habit is, is a key element to being able to, um, you know, develop our power. And so, in a sense, there's this curious relationship in which, you know, to enable autonomy, we have to also be able to negotiate the autonomic. Um, and we have to have this kind of relationship between the two. And so autonomy, in a sense, is not absence of the automatic, the autonomic, the habitual, um, the involuntary. It's not an absence of that. It's precisely the kind of organized, autonomous production of that. Um, and... In <laughs> I mean, uh, um, so this. I mean, this is a. This is a kind of thing that that it often takes. Uh, it often is a kind of. Like, I'm, I'm as I say, this is doing philosophy in public, so it often takes a kind of while for me to work through what uh, what kind of tension ex might exist or that I might be thinking about. Um, so one of the things that came to mind was this notion of off grid living. Uh, so people will often talk about their kind of, you know, often, you often see it on the internet or you can see it on YouTube, whatever. There's a lot of it about uh, off-grid living. And it's not just escape to the country. So I'm not kind of talking about that. I'm more talking about that kind of way in which a certain sort of, um, a certain sort of content is out there that explains, uh, gives the experience of, you know, educates, encourages people to step outside of um, the grid, uh, uh, the grid of capitalism, but often it's kind of derived from the electrical grid, isn't it, I think? But the grid of, of, of electricity and water and possibly money, but often electricity and water, those seem to be the big one. The grid of bills that come in for your, um, for your uh, amenities. Um, and you know, produce a lovely house in a lovely space that's kind of self-generating its own power and has its own waste systems. Um, well, one of the things you're not going to do there is want to do everything yourself. Okay, <laughs> you're going to want to, you know, you're going to organise your autonomy in that space is de dependent upon how much you can automate. Um, uh, and that doesn't mean you have to automate everything because that's not the idea. But but your actual autonomy is is very much dependent on what you can automate. Um, if you know, you, you, your 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 hours spent fetching on water and disposing of your waste, you know, are are not, um, as it were, made efficient or made sort of reasonable. Often through you know processes of kind of automation. If that if that doesn't happen, then then you're simply not going to have enough hours to survive. Um, there's going to be a point at which if you try and do everything afresh or, or basically it's going to be you know, deeply difficult to, to stay in the same place, let's say. And it's one of the reasons you might end up being nomadic because it's much easier to do that kind of hunter gathering if you're moving rather than staying still. So there's a kind of relationship between autonomy and the autonomic that's that's not simply one of opposition and not simply one of contradiction, but precisely one of a kind of positive negotiation. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, it, there's one in, inside that relationship. You can see that the, the, the in a sense, you know, autonomy is 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 able to be constricted by the autonomic. And so if there's a kind of automatism placed too heavily onto um, our living situation, then our autonomy is going to be affected. Um, and one of the things that, that you know might be argued by the Marxist model, for example, is that, 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 that any autonomy within a capitalist system is going to be limited to the commodity form. Um, and so, going to be limited to the necessity to buy and sell on a market, or you know, you know, a bunch of commodities, in, and those that commodity form affects uh, everything quite drastically. So it turns our food um, from something that's a, a sustained relationship with the world around us into this kind of commodity consumption relationship, um, and in doing so, uh, changes its nature. Um, and the, in a sense, the Marxist model would argue that that, that, that so, so any autonomy that you would argue is perhaps kind of going to be limited within uh, that capitalist system. But for those people who are looking for that autonomy, that limitation is probably not going to be enormously relevant. As I say, if they can find a way 
to kind of automate the energy and and the waste and the water in their house and and they can find a way to sort of get that organism to be semi autonomous from the grid um, through its own processes of automation its own autonomic structures then you know they're going to as it were have achieved enough they're going to have carved out enough space for them to work in um, and so I think one of the things I think you know one of the things I think it's important to kind of think about is that much of life is kind of willingly automated um, and not in such a way as to deny autonomy but to enable it or, or rather we believe and try to to sort of willingly willingly or to automate for autonomy um, and and the limit may be external as I say something like the capitalist commodity system so I think this is a different and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get to the chat about the dreaming stuff I think I'm just going to kind of because um, I think there's there's a sense in which I, I'll there's a sense in which I want to kind of bring uh, to bear on Curtis a different kind of model of power um, uh, and at the same time there's something positive I want to kind of draw out from Curtis um, and I think one of the things I wanted to draw out from Curtis is I say this kind of interaction with cybernetics as being placed back into its past and having this kind of this kind of developmental environment in, in which it grows up as it were um, and is imprinted with patterns are up from around from, from the way in which thought was taking place around it and I think there's an element of that that's kind of I want to draw from Curtis and think about positively uh, but there's also an element of dreaming that I think is kind of key um, to the way in which I'm interacting with Curtis's work um, it's one of the things that still motivates me to watch it and look at it is that there are these kind of images I talked about them as clips last time these kind of images or memes that still have a way of um, having an effect and I think one of the things that they're doing is offering us a collection of new materials to dream with um, and so I think there's something interesting but I'm gonna have to come back I think I think I'm gonna come back to that that idea about the dreaming because there's a couple of other bits that, that are in my research and I'd like to talk about with regard to that so it's just just to sort of finish off for today just let's I want to think again go back over that notion of power so let's track that back through so Curtis is kind of suggesting something like a loss of political power because of the loss of the collective um, a loss that occurs because of the rise of a kind of pernicious individualism um, and that this affects uh, um, a whole range of different people who are kind of responding to a previous situation of power the kind of colonial situation of power from the sort of 40s 50s they're responding to a kind of what we might call an authoritarian um, sort of a situation sort of soft and hard authoritarian uh, in which you know the individual is is definitely subordinate to the collective whether it be the social you know the party uh, you know or the community or whatever but the individual is definitely subordinate and so there's a response he thinks in the 60s and 70s it's a response to this previous situation of power in which we're sort of subordinate to the collective that takes the route of emphasizing the individual and in doing so disables the collective but produces a kind of isolation and loss of power um, and as i suggested that the the premise here seems to be that power is kind of quantitative um, power is something we hold and can hold more of only when there's more of us uh, and in contrast beginning to think about autonomy and the autonomic might give us a different way of thinking about the cybernetic because I mean in a sense what I'm trying to do is trying to think about what what's positive as well as negative within the cybernetic um, because I mean, Curtis is, he, Curtis is 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 uh, kind of kind of take on the cybernetic could just be very very negative. It does seem quite as it, it seems as though he doesn't want to find uh, anything other than a kind of negativity here. And it's always a bit odd when people do that because I think uh, oops, that's very creaky. It's always a bit odd when people do that because I think one of the things that's fascinating about 
um, technologies as they develop is that they kind of develop in so far as they can increase our kind of capacities and our powers whether that be the printing technology or or phone technologies and so they kind of take on um, the role that they do precisely because of their capacity to increase our powers and it seems you know odd I mean they, they also trap and do all sorts of other negatives as well and perhaps quite often do the negatives more than the positives but fundamentally the only reason they have an effect in the first place is because they're kind of cap capable of increasing our power um, enabling us to do things we couldn't do before let's say um, and so it would be odd to in a sense not celebrate that 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 production of that extra capacity um, whilst we may want to be cautious about um, what effects it has and so I think that's one of the reasons it's worth thinking kind of positively about um, some of the cybernetics because uh, I mean and, and I mean the, these discussions have kind of occurred in different places on the left and I don't want to kind of reference them sort of too too quickly but but essentially the thought here is is not so much um, it's not so much a question of whether technology is good or bad or neutral or any of those kind of things. It's more just a kind of uh, it's more just a kind of thought that it, it's it's never going to get us very far if we dismiss something too quickly, um, uh, because its importance often derives from something that may be useful or may be necessary or may be pleasurable or you know. Um, so with that thought there i mean want to just kind of i want to kind of push at something about what power is and i think i'm going to finish with this sort of moment um because it was something that was really interesting and i want to kind of come back to but it was the way in which black power in particular is used by curtis in the second episode as a kind of example of both a positive and negative relationship to increasing power um, <clears throat> but there's something in the way in which uh, Stokely Carmichael is presented towards the end which I think speaks to the idea of power uh, differently from um, the way in which Curtis and, and liberal democ democrats might kind of think of it in, in sense quantitatively um, and it's to do with the kind of relationships that, that power kind of expresses um, now Curtis himself does actually say that well, you know one of the things that's lost uh, one of the things he says is, is what you are and what you feel not just from the inside um, you know he's sort of not just from the inside but from where you are in the power structure because that flows through you too um, and so it's this kind of flow of power that I'm beginning to want to sort of look at and the way in which dreaming part perhaps has some you know important role to play here and i'm going to look at that next week i think so here's here's just the end piece from stokely carmichael this is the end of episode two when you see an individual white boy you're not afraid of that individual white boy what you are afraid of is the power that he represents because behind him stands the local police force the state militia the army the navy the air force you see an African, there is no power behind him. There is no one speaking for his interests. There is no one to protect him. The gorilla studies. The gorilla studies. He doesn't rap. He studies and keeps his mouth shut. Study children, study. Right, I'm going to leave it there and be back next week. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks for listening, and I'll catch you soon.